Okay. All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Artificial Intelligence Unleashed. Um, I'm Shumit Paul Chowdhury. I have the honor of serving New Scientist as its editor-in-chief. So um, just to open the discussion a little bit, I thought I'd offer a few kind of remarks to ground what we're going to be talking about. Over the past five years or so, we've seen an explosion in the capabilities of what we might call machines that can think. Um, that's to say they're definitely machines. Whether they can think or not, it depends on how you define thinking, really. Um, but what we can say is that they're machines that are capable of learning, of recognizing patterns, and of solving problems as a result of that. And in fact, they've proven far better at solving problems, uh, ranging from playing games to detecting tumors, than we would ever have thought um, just a few years ago. For most of computing's history, problems like those have seemed to be completely impossible, the kinds of things that only human beings can tackle. But actually now, computers are routinely better at those kinds of tasks in terms of both speed and accuracy than we humans are. A recent survey of 352 AI researchers by the University of Oxford in the UK and by Yale University found that the majority thought that um, machines would be better at us than at everything by 2060, pretty much. Um, that's translating languages by 2024, driving a truck by 2027, working in retail by 2031, writing a best-selling book by 2049, and at surgery by 2053. So there's not a lot of room for human hubris in that uh, statement. <laughs> Um, and intriguingly, it was actually the researchers based in Asia who were most bullish about those predictions. Um, they suggested that, humans, that computers would be better at everything than humans within 30 years. Um, elsewhere, it was 74 years. So Asian researchers are particularly keen, or well, keen, maybe is not the right word, are particularly um, certain that this is going to be the case. So it's not surprising that we're talking with increasing urgency about what it means to handle over responsibility for decision making to artificial intelligences. Um, that depends you know, whether we're talking on recommendations about what products you should buy, um, what kind of treatment you should get for your diseases, uh, who should get credit, or what kind of jail sentence is most likely to deter criminals from reoffending. And um, the range of things that we hand over to algorithms and to artificial intelligences is probably only going to increase and increase quite rapidly over the next few years. So, should we embrace this trend or should we seek to moderate it? Um, that is, should we seek to unleash AI, as the title of this panel suggests, or should we seek to tighten the leash and make it more restrictive, be more careful about what we do with it? That throws up lots of questions. Uh, the most discussed, which you'll all have heard about, I'm sure, is the effect on employment, uh, where there are lots of startling estimates of how many jobs will be lost to AI over the next couple of decades. But the question we want to answer today is, as we grant more autonomy to artificial intelligence to make choices on our behalf, how do we make sure it decides in our best interests? That is not a trivial question. Computers are very good at particular tasks, but they have no common sense. They have no ability to take the context in which they make decisions into account. Um, that might be a strength or it might be a weakness. It depends on how cynical you are about human objectivity and self-interest. But nonetheless, it's an unfamiliar and potentially alienating approach to making decisions. A second issue is the data on which artificial intelligences are trained today, in most part, comes from human beings. And that raises questions about, um, well, one, about how you compensate the people who are providing labor of a sort to train the systems. Um, another is the garbage in, garbage out effect, to put it bluntly, which is that if the data is not good, neither are the outcomes. And the decisions made on it may be poor or in some way socially suboptimal. And there was an investigation last year by ProPublica which found that um, a risk assessment algorithm used by criminal justice systems in the US was biased against black people. Now, the reasons for that are still debated. Um, and the reason they're debated is because AIs can't explain what they do. Um, it's worth remembering that neither can we most of the time. So you know, that's not a strike against artificial intelligence, but we can't explain how they reach the conclusions they do. So it's difficult for us to judge whether they are being correct, unfair, or otherwise. So those are the subjects we're going to be exploring in this session, and I'm delighted we have a superb panel to discuss them with. In the interest of time, I'm only going to get, introduce them very briefly, um, but I do look, urge you to look up their full resumes, which are very impressive, um, on the, uh, the app or the website. So to my left is Vishal Sikha, who is the director of the board's chief executive officer and managing director of Infosys, one of the world's largest IT service exporters. His background includes work in artificial intelligence, intelligent systems, programming languages and models, and information management. He's been at Stanford, Zero, the Xerox Palo Alto Labs, and SAP previously. Um, Yachin Zhang is the president of Baidu. He's a um, formerly headed research for Microsoft in Asia, and is an honorary or guest professor at more than 20 universities, has been granted more than 60 US patents, and published more than 500 papers and 11 monographs. Pascal Fung is, sorry, I've lost my page. Let me just go back there. 
is a professor in the Department of Electronic and Computer Engineering at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Her publication topics include spoken language systems, natural language processing, and empathetic human-robot interaction. She's a member of the Global Future Council on Artificial Intelligence and Robotics, which is a think tank of the WEF. Wendell Wallach is chair of the Technology and Ethics Studies group at the Interdisciplinary Center for Bioethics at Yale University. He's the author of A Dangerous Master, How to Keep Technology from Slipping Beyond Our Control. And he's co-chair of the WEF's Global Future Council on Technology, Values, and Policy. And finally, last but not least, Kamal Sinclair is the director of the Sundance Institute's New Frontier Labs program, partnering to develop and platform landmark projects in the evolution of story, including experimentations with virtual reality, augmented reality, data intelligence, transmedia, haptic technology, projection mapping, and smart objects. And if you just join me in, the, in thanking the panel for joining us. Thank you. Right. Um, I'm going to keep looking down here because there's a phone down here. There isn't one in the room, so I've got to make sure I keep on time. So uh, my first question, um, I wanted to try and get this started with something relatively broad. Um, so we hear a lot about how AI is a, is a supreme disruptor and that it's nothing like anything that's gone before. So I wanted to ask Vishal, um, is that how you see it? Is it really fundamentally different to the kinds of information and communication technologies we've already seen? Um, well, there are two ways to look at that. One is that uh, AI is a... Uh, the latest one among a long history, a long pantheon of technologies that have continually improved things, continually amplified our abilities and, and so forth. And, and uh, it's been going on uh, since the Industrial Revolution or even before that, that techniques and tools and technologies that help us do more, become more productive and so forth. The other way to look at it, of course, is that this time around it is about our minds and our brains and uh, there's something more mystical going on and, and so forth. And uh, uh, I tend to, you know, uh, everyone has their own opinion on, on these things, obviously, but uh, my own sense is that the AI technology is not falling from the skies. It is not being delivered in some holy water coming from, from some mountain. It is uh, being built by us. It is being written by people like us. And uh, therefore, it is yet another one of our creations. And uh, I think it is important to keep that in perspective. It is incredibly powerful, obviously, and uh, it has incredibly far-reaching consequences already, like you said, uh, and the studies that you mentioned. Um, but the key is that uh, it is something that we can all learn. It is something that we can all uh, get, get to uh, be builders of rather than victims of. And uh, uh, the more we think of it from that point of view, I, I think that the, the less uh, uh, we can be, uh, the, the, the less we have to be afraid of it. Uh, the more we understand it, the more that we improve it, the more that we, uh, uh, that we become able to, uh, to develop these, the less we can have uh, a fear of it. Okay. Anybody want to come back on that? I would say that, uh, you know, in the old days when the photography was first invented, people were afraid. They thought that the uh, photograph would take your soul from you. Mm -hmm. Remember that? So, um, and I agree that AI has been around for a long time. It's just what happened in recent years is that we have more data, we have more powerful machines to make our algorithms uh, to be more powerful, and it's being applied in many areas. So people are more aware of it. Um, in fact, uh, we have been using AI technologies for decades already. So um, I think this is, uh, this is the trend. The fundamental difference, I would say, between AI technologies and other information technologies really is the learning ability of the machines. That the machine does not simply memorize uh, your name or your address or something, but it actually is learning to be better in making decisions, in recognizing your voice, in uh, translating the text. So it's that learning ability, I think, that distinguishes this this technology from previous IT. Does that, um, does that present a challenge to us? I mean, the, the kind of challenge it presents to us as humans feels very different at this point in time. Um, is that going to go away? I mean, does anyone want to respond to that? Is, that? is that a transitory feeling, or is that something we're going to live with forever? Well, you know, let me just uh, add, you know, AI is certainly a transformative force. You know, and it's going to you know, transform everything we do. Uh, but there's no mystery, there's no uh, stigma, there's uh, no fear, no panic. Uh, when I look at the AI, it's a uh, lot of data, it's uh, very advanced, neural network, you know, algorithms. 
and it's uh, all the computing the power. Um, so if you have a smart uh, computer scientist, make sure you write the right code. It will help us, it will empower us, it will be, uh, amplify our capability. But it's not gonna replace human being. Might be some other things, but not the way we design. Obviously there are concerns, you know, we have uh, all need to uh, rec recognize and to address those concerns. Uh, but you know, there's no fear or panic. <laughs> There's a real difficulty in this discussion because we often get caught between the technologies we have today and the technologies we might have. So if we're really talking about perhaps in 30, 50, 100 years, whatever it is, you can outperform humans in all tasks, you're talking about something more than the data processing, these recent breakthroughs that we've had that have been largely about looking and discovering patterns in massive amounts of data and therefore solving some of the cognitive problems of perception, but not perhaps some of the larger problems of learning, such as unstructured learning or other things that we can be talking about. So I think we always have to be very careful here when we talk to be clear that when we're talking about artificial intelligence, whether we're talking about what's been developed so far and whether we're projecting that into other tasks that are coming down the line. But when you talk about, um, I mean, so in terms of what's coming down the line, I mean, what's coming down the line is based in what we're doing now and what we're doing today. So there is a directionality here, and um, you know, in terms of the way that the technology is going to go. At the moment, you know, the anxiety is about it supplanting human judgment and about that being the direction in which it's being forced. Um, and as the gentleman over here and as Pascal has said, um, there are, you can demystify this. It, can be, it, it is a tool that we are building. Mm -hmm. so, um, so presumably there are other ways that we could guide the technology. Um, I mean, do we have a moral duty to do that? Is that an obligation placed on us? Well, I think we definitely have a moral obligation to guide the technology because the technology can perform harms. This is not wise technology or all wise technology in and of itself. So we first of all have a responsibility to ensure that it does not cause harm to human beings and that we find ways of dealing with any negative societal impacts that might happen, such as technological unemployment, if that is actually going to be a real impact. And I'm among those who believe that will be an impact. So we're in this situation where on the one hand, we want to maximize benefits that are being projected, particularly into areas like healthcare and so forth that are constantly trumpeted as areas in which perhaps AI can give us great capacity to move forward. At the same time, we need to be minimizing the potential harms, the, the minimizing the potential negative societal consequences. So that brings a moral obligation on us immediately. I think there's a second moral obligation, which is who are we creating this world for? Mm -hmm. What is this world really about that we are creating? What is the role for human beings in this world we're shaping? Is it just to make our lives easier? Or are we really creating a transhumanist society, which is really going to be about the technologies taking over the Earth and leaving us behind? So I think it's pretty clear there's getting to be close to 8 billion of us on this planet. And we do have a moral obligation to make sure that the technologies we put in place serve the interests of humanity as a whole, not just a small segment of it or a small segment of those who are best able to capitalize on technological advances. So two, one clarification, if I may, uh, um, and one uh, response. Um, so by way of clarification, so you're talking about an active role here. This is, so you're not, uh, you're not um, endorsing a position in which we say, actually, the laissez-faire way is the way, the way to do it. Competition, economics, the market will sort this out in some way. You're not, are you advocating that we take a more regulatory route or a more, um, is that kind of how you would do this? Well, a regulatory route is a possible way of going. 
I happen to be very much involved in the governance of AI and robotics, and I think we need a totally new model to govern emerging technologies. The regulatory route is largely dead. We don't have legislators who can take stay on top of all the sciences that are coming out of the fourth industrial revolution. There's a reaction to overregulation. So we're in a universe where that's not going to be satisfactory unto itself. But perhaps we're in a universe where industry for the first time can take leadership. And I think it may take leadership in the realm of AI, partially because there's a GMO-like elephant lurking in the AI closet ready to pounce out. And what I mean by that is GMOs have been, they have been uh, rejected by Europe and Canada. The AI industry does not want to see a large public reaction against artificial intelligence. So I think the industry might be more involved in responsibly looking for ways to regulate it. Now that said, those kinds of soft governance mechanisms, they're never sufficient. You're also going to need some form of hard regulation to at least punish wrongdoers or violators, those who don't deploy their technologies in a responsible manner. Okay. Uh, Vishal, Yachin, do you want to respond to that? Do you, do you want the responsibility of working out what the, the good way of doing this is, the best way of doing this is? Um, we are still quite far from being able to do that in a good way. Um, we have built powerful technologies before. I mean, if you look at nuclear technology, for example, back in the 40s and 50s, there used to be a lot of debate about nuclear containment because people did not know how chain reactions would evolve and what damage they would do and things like that. Ultimately, we figured that out. Um, it's a somehow a similar kind of a situation what, what Wendell is talking about. The, um, um, earlier in your introduction, you mentioned uh, uh, our inability to explain things. Mm -hmm. So in the early days of AI, when expert systems were being built, there was this um, unique problem that people would, AI experts would go and talk to experts like doctors or lawyers um, and interview them about how they did their decision making. And uh, they would cross check these and cross reference these. And it was interesting that inevitably the explanations that people would provide of how they make their decisions was wrong. Mm. Uh, so a doctor would look at a patient and come to a conclusion about what ails them and so forth. But when you ask them to explain their decision making process, their explanation was wrong. And, and this hampered a lot of the early work in AI uh, around building complex models. So our inability to explain these things uh, is, a, is a very unique thing. And a simple way to say that is um, a great tennis coach once said that the parts of our brain that play tennis are not the parts that speak English. Um, and, and so now when you take that forward to our ability to articulate what these systems do, um, uh, as, as you mentioned, the deep learning systems that, that we have today are even more opaque Mm -hmm. Because when a deep neural network learns a particular behavior, it has no ability to articulate what that behavior is. It is just better than humans mm -hmm. at doing that thing, identifying a picture of a cat or identifying fraud or whatever it is that, that it is doing. So our ability to build articulate systems or to be able to ascribe behaviors to systems automat um, automatically and accurately uh, is incredibly important before we even answer that question of how do we put a containment around these systems. And you say at the moment that's not feasible. At the moment we are very far from that. We don't even know how these systems work. We know that the neural networks settle down on certain behaviors after a large amount of data has been churned through them, but then they have no way to explain what they do. I mean, at, this, at the moment, uh, if you ask any one of the search engines, you know, um, one of, a friend of mine recently gave me a wonderful query. Um, how tall was the President of the United States when John F. Kennedy was born? And uh, none of the search engines can answer it. Yet a six-year-old child can answer that question. And each of the search engines knows the answers to the three individual questions that are inside that question. Mm. Um, so our ability to synthesize behavior, to articulate behavior, is still in its infancy. OK. So I want to ask a, um, a meaninglessly high-level question at this point um, of my panel and then of the audience. So, um, so just in one word, would you, at, at, at this point, just sent, this is sentiment, nothing more. Um, would you tighten um, the regulation of AI as it currently stands or relax it? So if we can just go I would ahead. understand it first. Okay. I would get people that's, who... That's, that's a cheat. Tighten or relax. <laughs> um, 
No, you have to try it down. Okay. We need to advance uh, innovation, and we need to have uh, more awareness and, and some level of uh, understanding and uh, regulatory and, and the governance. Right. It's okay. time. Pascal. Both unleash the innovation, but regulate the application, the safety and security. Wendell. The same. It's really the deployment that's the issue. I don't think any of us want to regulate scientific yeah. discovery, but we need to put parameters around what does and does not get deployed. Okay, come on. Um, I believe that we have to engineer robust inclusion in the determination of value systems around artificial intelligence and these new technologies. Um, and that means that I, we, we need to unleash the power of innovation and the power of human capacity as we become more uh, enabled by these things to uh, achieve kind of beyond our current capabilities as a, as a human being. But we also need to do that with, I think the checks and balances about inclusion versus just regulation because regulation can be faulty in and of itself if it has blind spots from just a top-down regulation. I do believe we need to catalyze a groundswell of imagination from the cultural sector, from the lay people, and create processes where they can understand this even at high levels, maybe they don't know the code. And that in and of itself, I think, will help us to create the checks and balances that even the smartest people in this room may not even be aware of without that robust inclusion okay. of, of people. All right, thank you. So that's kind of a, a sense of, of we want to keep the discovery process going, but we need some more controls downstream of that, I think. Can I just get a sense of the sentiment in the room, please? Um, can I just have a show of hands? Um, so for, and I realize this is a very high level question, um, tighter controls on what we do with AI. Hands up, please. A few there, a few there, a few there, because they're not that many. Okay, and looser. <laughs> and that's nice. That's all right. That's okay. <laughs> okay. And almost, the, and virtually, and the, but the vast majority is don't know, or both, or that was a stupid question, which I mean, I'll, I'll take that. That's okay. You know. Don't care. So, um, so okay. I'm just trying to get a, a sense of the mood. So the mood is kind of mixed, right? Fine. Good. Okay. Um, so uh, you talked about the difficulty of um, of controlling these systems if we don't understand them fully. Um, so maybe we can imagine them if we can't yeah. explain them if we can't. Talk sure, certainly. So I, I imagine people in the room are wondering, how did she get on this panel coming from uh, Sundance Institute, which is a film organization traditionally, um, but the program that I direct is a convergence space for scientists, technologists, and storytellers. And why is that critical? Because if any of these things are to be implemented in a way that mitigates some of the pain points that we've seen in past industrial revolutions, we have to have an, a strategy for the cultural sector. We have to have a strategy for engagement with those that don't understand these systems at these high levels. So I, some of the ideas that, that have been bubbling up from this community, um, the Ford Foundation has been commissioning uh, Rockefeller. There's a, a number of, of uh, foundations that cross policy and cultural sector lines. Um, have empowered me and others, peers in the field, to do is to do a survey of what, um, what is a way that these emerging technologies and these emerging media, particularly around artificial intelligence, um, can proliferate with equality, justice, and with that sense of identity frameworks going forward. And out of this massive survey that we've done, um, everybody keeps coming back with something to the effect of democratizing imagination. Um, finding a way to engineer that robust inclusion and imagining our futures so that not only is it this kind of top-down kind of Robert Moses approach to prescribing how societies and cultures are going to adopt this new framework that artificial intelligence will give us, these new capabilities, um, but actually will allow uh, communities to, through an imagination process, start to find out who do I want to be in that future. If I see the fundamental features of what artificial can do in terms of its functionality, what values do I ascribe that to? And we can look at nuclear energy as, yes, a great success in many ways, but also a great failure in the narrow number of people that were part of the imagination of what the value systems were going to be around nuclear energy. And we, we learned hard lessons through that. Um, and I think that ways of mitigating those kinds of hard lessons this time is to do that. And, and an example that came up many times in the survey and that we had done was looking at indigenous cultures in the Industrial Revolution uh, in the United States uh, at the turn of the 18th, 19th centuries, that we were still in a state of genocide at that point, And there was a very much an exclusion of uh, those that were not at the table understanding how to adopt these new capabilities we had with that Industrial Revolution. And now we've got the bill, which is climate change. We, did not include a set of value systems and perceptions, and we had our own blind spots 
now we are trying to mitigate, we're trying to deal with that, you know, at this point. So how can we avoid those kinds of blind spots in this current paradigm shift? Um, some of the questions that have come up, I, I interviewed a Mohawk woman who's an indigenous, indigenous uh, woman who runs game design workshops with youth all over Canada. She is also um, a, a technologist. And she talked about 20 years of contention between her role as a technologist about rapid iteration, fast fail, um, and uh, return on investment, and her value systems as an indigenous woman with community, time, space, and a different, sometimes non-analytical approach to knowledge generation. And in the 20 years that she's been in this field, she's had a contention between those two, the technology cultural value system and her indigenous value system. And when we went through an imagination exercise of how artificial intelligence might look in the future for her community, she was able to identify an integrated vision of what it looks like where AI freeing us from the burden of some of the repetitive work that we're all so afraid of losing actually frees us up for a renaissance of culture, a renaissance of creativity, and a shift in where our core values are with how we spend our day and our time that matches more her indigenous values. So I think that part of the concern, the fear that we're feeling uh, in the world around these incredible new technologies is not just the technology itself, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a traumatized shell shock to seeing how it has been in the past. Mis the transitions have, been, uh, have, have not been um, managed very well in the past, so we're afraid of systems of oppression being um, uh, entrenched with these new technologies rather than alleviated with these new technologies. And I think that when we democratize that imagination, and we're already seeing it with Afrofuturism, with um, the world building uh, work that's happening among game designers and storytellers and augmented reality and virtual reality, where you can take a group of stakeholders, they can engineer a, a shared vision of what that future is, and then generate it with fidelity through these new immersive mediums. And we're already seeing they did it with a Bedouin tribe in Saudi Arabia, with a waterlogged city in, in, in Nigeria. And they were actually, those stakeholders that went through that imagination process are now building out in social innovation, uh, entrepreneurship, new educational systems based on the vision of how AI could be implemented, how these new technologies could be implemented, but from the ground up. So I think that that's a critical point that we haven't necessarily seen in the past. We did not have the technological capability in the past to do that kind of democratized imagination, and I'm hoping that we can uh, do better this time. So, um, <laughs> Yachin, um, so you talked about how there is no mystique here, or there shouldn't be mystique here. Um, in, in around AI, um, that uh, SDK, SDK, no yeah. mystique. Sorry, oh, there's nothing magical about AI. Right. Um, so what Kamal is talking about is is actually kind of the opposite, right? That's that's it's using the tools of mystique of of magic of creation to <laughs> to strip away um, the imagined mystique around AI. So people have an image of AI. If you give them access to the tools, if you help them to work their way through it, then then maybe they don't have that. Does that? Does yeah. that help you? Does that kind of you know, it does. speak to you? Know, <laughs> this uh, AI is uh, a, a tool. Uh, it's, uh, it's power, and, and you have to use it for the benefits of people. So you know, there are really three things uh, I think uh, as a society we should be, uh, become more conscious about. First, you know, make sure there's not a new value system. Right? So AI or machine learning you know, follow the human uh, you know, value system. So, uh, in the sense that really expand, argument our capability. The second, make sure our technology uh, you know, are predictable, are precise, and are robust. So make sure it does things we design for. And the third is uh, the governance and the openness. Uh, the more companies uh, share their source code, share their data, share their algorithms, the more secure, reliable uh, the technology will be. And that's why I really like uh, some of the initiatives, like the open AI, uh, and the benefits, uh, AI for ben benefits of AI, and also uh, IEEE. They actually have done some very impressive work. Uh, so there has been already been a lot of uh, great thoughts put in place to address those uh, concerns. Again, openness. Uh, you know, right now, there are companies begin to share the platform. Uh, for example, Baidu, we uh, recently open source uh, autonomous driving platform. Uh, it includes the source code, all the hardware configuration, a lot of data, uh, technology, and the cloud services. 
and I encourage more companies to do the same. Then we become you know, more secure, safe, and uh, more reliable. Pascal, um, does that? So uh, that, um, I will add uh, to that, I, I agree totally with the Ya Qing. Uh, but I do think that um, there are certain things that um, depends on the developer of AI. So first, um, so engineers, we don't have uh, the equivalent of Socrates of. Like uh, we are trained as uh, engineers, not as medical doctors. So we have never been taught so the so-called value system. We just learn it through osmosis and, and all that. So I think there needs to be a, a more um, uh, education in, in terms of educating our young engineers of the future, they need to be more ethical, more ethics education, and more humanities education, more arts education. Because now, as compared to before when we were building transistors and uh, circuits and laser technology, we're actually building technology that serve humans. Right? This is why people are concerned, because it's a human-centric technology. That's the main difference between AI and the other technologies. Now, so the engineers, we have to work with people, for people, and we're actually training machines to learn from people. But we're normally, we're not traditionally trained to do such a job. All right, so I think I can see there's some kind of overwhelming burden on today's AI engineers and developers where where we would like to just focus on the deep neural net and the tuning of the parameters, but actually we have a lot more responsibilities than that. And that extends from all the company leaders to the developer who's using the open source code uh, and developing a new application that might reach 10 million users the next day or, or the next year. So by the way, I want to say that the AI technology compared to other previous technologies is actually a great democratizing force because it enables people who are not technical, who didn't go to an engineering schools, who don't have a PhD, to use technologies that can, you know, you can, you can have all these technologies at your fingertips to help you to do your job better or to live better. Actually, you know, I, I do not see AI as a threatening force. It's really uh, helping us to be more powerful as human beings. It's not the machines versus us. It's machines helping us. And in the future, uh, there will always be demands of people who have to teach machines. Mm -hmm. Even if you have a robot surgeon, some surgeon has to teach that robot, mm -hmm. right? So there's always going to be demand for human knowledge and human know-how. <laughs> And uh, we need to be continuously, so what people talk about continuous learning, right? Lifelong learning. And uh, that's how we can participate as a population in the process of technology innovation. Make no mistake about it, AI is not like the other technology. It does require more human involvement from all walks of lives. I, I have not, I've been in this area for 30 years. I've not seen so much attention from all kinds of people. And this is because AI is a human-oriented technology. So what you're, um, so, uh, may I just, sorry. Um, so, um, uh, so what you're talking about here is, um, what everyone has talked about so far, I think, really, apart perhaps, is, um, is, is very much from the developer's point of view, from the builder's point of view. Uh, we've talked about giving the tools to people so that they can understand the technology and use it. Um, but it strikes me that, um, that it is human-centric and it's making use of people in other ways. I mean, so there right. are, it is making use of, pe in, of people in the sense that they provide the data, so that's one sense. And it also makes use of people in the sense, well, makes use of it, it you were talking about systems of oppression. Um, there's, um, there's a sense in which you can opt out of AI that exists at the moment. Um, you, can, you can not use services that use algorithmic recommendations. You can not apply for credit where you know, a bank uses a, an automated credit system and so on. Um, that sort of puts it on a par with things like paying your taxes, right? Is, this, you know, is that a reasonable balance? So Wendell, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, is, is, this, is this kind of use of people who are not necessarily giving explicit permission to be used by a system, is that fair? Is that um, reasonable? Yeah, I think we have a lot of problems here that sort of get glossed over a little too easily. Um, particularly when we start using words like democratization. At least right now, in the stages of the development of AI, it's he who controls the data, controls the problems that AI will tackle. And at least for the near future, the IT 
industry will be the AI industry in the sense that they control a great deal of the data. There will be a democratization to the extent that there are subgroups that might control medical data or other forms of data that become important. But that is not the bulk of the data. That becomes data in very specialized places. Then there becomes a second question about well, what about the rest of us? Are we just data producers? Because sometimes, at least in this stage of the development of AI, that's what it feels like we're talking about. And who owns that data ultimately? Um, do the, does the industry just own that data? Or do people have some rights based on the data that they produce? Yachi and Vishal, I mean, for you, presumably, it's, um, it's very profitable if we are just sources of data, we're just data producers. What's your response to that? Yeah, I, I don't think there's any ambiguity in my mind. The user needs to be uh, the control of all you know, his or her data and need to you know, opt in, opt out. And that is her option, right? It's, it is, uh, I mean, the whole point of uh, developing AI is to serve people and people need to control that. But opting out is a very blunt process. So just to give you a, an anecdote, if I may, for a second. Um, since arriving in China, I've discovered myself on the wrong side of the digital divide, since mm -hmm. I don't have any local apps and so on. The short version of which is I've been completely incapable of catching a taxi, either in Beijing or here, because all of the taxis are now using um, right. you know, ride-sharing services. Right. Right. And I have no way of getting a taxi. Um, that's not, and that's my choice. It's binary. I can either take a taxi or not take a taxi. It's not very much, there's not gradation of control there. Well, if you spend two more weeks, you will know how to catch a taxi. <laughs> <laughs> but but that, that is a, a great point. In fact, uh, uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, new uh, uh, products, uh, market opportunities by, by AI. In fact, uh, most of the time, you know, we spend in advancing these uh, uh, technologies and opportunities. And this is actually a great platform to talk about the other side. Uh, and, and Mr. Wallace, you mentioned about the jobs. And I think uh, uh, we create a new markets and new jobs. A lot of uh, the jobs will go away, uh, you know, whether it's uh, you know, staff jobs uh, or, or even radiologists or uh, uh, translators or drivers. Lots of these jobs are going to go away. So as a society uh, and, and also as a corporate, uh, we need to really be responsible and responsive to this needs, make sure we provide the right kind of tools, trainings, to make sure you know, people are not left behind. There are also other concerns you know, I personally have. It's about data. It's not about you know, the privacy or security. It's about the openness of data. Now, if, if you look at the PC internet uh, days, actually it's pretty open. You know, the internet was very simple. You have a PC, you have a browser, it's HTML and all the data are searchable. And it's pretty good. It's, it's, uh, but when we move to the mobile internet, you find the companies actually unlock their data, the APP, the apps. Right? It's pretty hard to search, find the information within APP. All the contents uh, and the information actually are become locked. It's against the very principle of uh, internet. What my fear is we move into AI and IoT because data is so valuable, right. and the companies have the intention to fragment and, and lock this data. So come on, you're going to come is, back up. Yeah, this is something that I think is really critical in terms of um, catalyzing robust critique of how we formulate our, how we are formulating the structures with which AI will be unleashed into. Um, for example, uh, about four and a half years ago, I was in conversations with a lot of major film studios, uh, studios that were dealing in media, and at that time, there had been a big kind of flashpoint with Netflix, particularly because House of Cards had started doing so well, and that was a content that was constructed through um, the analyzation of, of, of the data. Of their, they found out Kevin Spacey was really uh, something that was trending. They found out that political dramas was trending, and they constructed House of Cards, and boom, you had this great success. So now, all of a sudden, all these major studios and media companies were trying to create algorithms and to create a, a framework with which we could mine the data. And what started happening is hyper customization, hyper um, customization that narrowed the results that were coming back to their audience, so that they were being fed what they've already 
consumed, and being fed what you've already consumed narrows your worldview. At the time, there was a, there was a marginalized group of voices saying, you know, if we can, if we're only following what we think is uh, optimizing the revenue flow of you know, doing this hyper customization through these algorithms, we're going to cannibalize ourselves eventually because people are going to get bored of seeing the same thing over and over again. But we're also going to narrow people's worldviews. But that voice was kind of silenced at the prospect of these great revenue uh, thresholds that were, were coming from, from this hyper customization. Well, we saw now four years later the backlash of those filter bubbles. And especially in the United States when you have, you know, the Wall Street Journal did a, a, a filter bubble test on red and blue, uh, you know, kind of state ideologies and there was zero overlap in the media that they were consuming. Zero overlap. How much will our algorithms is that, you know, if we're not constructing in that blind spot and, and to, to kind of mitigate our own fallibilities in the way that we're constructing these structures for AIs to be unleashed in, then that becomes incredibly, exponentially more problematic. Pascal. I think nobody thinks that AI technology today is perfect. Mm -hmm. And technology is never perfect and it's forever evolving, forever developing. And what you have raised are issues and concerns that we all have as developers and researchers as well. But when there is a pain point, right, then there needs to be a solution, so there needs to be innovation. What you describe as a situation where you can't get a taxi because of all these services, I'm sure if this gets really bad for a lot of people, there will be a new business created, a new technology created based on, I don't know, what algorithm today that will come out and fulfill that need. Mm -hmm. Similarly, when we realize there's a hyper-personalization of recommendation engines, we're only realizing that now because we're still very excited about it, I think a couple of years ago. But we're realizing it now and we're realizing the balkanization of the political ideology and all that because of the res uh, as a result of that, uh, only this year, I think, I mean, within the last year. Now, once there's a realization just like with any technology, we realize there's a problem, there's a pain point, then the innovation process kicks in. I can, be sh I can assure you that some of us will be thinking of how to solve that problem using algorithms, using more, uh, uses, I mean, sorry, using more technology. But th this is ultimately what we do as engineers, that well, we try to solve problems. That's where the short-sighted, that's why the robust, because there, there was a peanut gallery of critique already starting four years ago around that, calling that, predicting yeah. that that filter bubble would start to happen. Right. And there was also a critique about the short-sightedness of the optimization of the revenue, because if you're cannibalizing and narrowing people's worldviews to their consumption is so narrow, you're missing this huge palette of other ways that you could sell content and products and services. So I think that that's where we uh, agree that, that it can't just be an engineer that doesn't have any background in all these other disciplines. There has to be some kind of an engineering where the engineer that doesn't have the medical background or the media content background is in conversation in some sort of a strategic yeah. way to mitigate those blind spots a little earlier than, than kind of the moment that we just went through where we saw those filter bubbles kind of explode. I think we have a real problem here in that we really have not created the culture for engineers to have all the sensibilities that they are going to need to have to be aware of the applications of the technologies they're developing. There have been a lot of recommendations around that. One is to put social scientists or ethicists in the design teams, not as naysayers, but as people sensitive to considerations that might not come up otherwise. But it's also a problem about the siloed kind of education we have and the siloed kind of reward system we have. We have not created the reward system for the kinds of transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary skills that we constantly we say we need, but almost nobody really gets rewarded for having those That's kinds right. of abilities. And even the silo busting is very difficult. I've been convening these workshops, bringing together the leaders of many fields that will impact upon the development of AI. It's very hard for the engineers, even the best of them, to listen to what some of the social scientists are trying to point out to them. It's very difficult to create the teams where they can work together and develop new technologies. So this is also part of the new jobs that perhaps we can create, which is a whole new cross-disciplinary culture where people can work together and they do think beyond their own specialties. Okay. 
Um, so I just want to do a, a quick round before we, um, before we open the floor to questions. Um, so my final kind of uh, question I wanted to ask um, is what, um, are some states, some societies more ready for AI than others? And what do we do to make um, societies ready for AI? How do we prepare? I mean, so Wendell's just talked about the lack of, of interdisciplinary thinking um, and how that affects our ability to deal with these kinds of issues. Um, what, do you reckon, what would you recommend in terms of preparing a society as a whole? What do we need to do? Vishal, do you want to kick off? The, uh, um, I think every society is ready for different aspects of AI mm -hmm. in different ways. Uh, if you look at AI today, the applications of AI uh, are limited by our imagination. The, uh, uh, there are thousands, thousands of applications that we already have uh, which are beneficial to some, disruptive to others. And depending on the nature of the society that you're referring to, some countries have lots of resources, lots of money, not enough people. So certain group of, groups of applications apply. Other countries have lots of people, not enough resources. I think there you would have a different set of priorities and so forth. So uh, one has to look at it from the perspective of what are these technologies and what implications can these have on a particular society or a particular segment of the society. Maybe in a little bit more concrete way, you could say um, uh, in, in, in places like, like India and China, there is a tremendous opportunity to train a lot of people on AI technology because the prospect of previous generation jobs being displaced by technology is quite severe. Um, and so therefore, the imperative has to be to train lots of people on these technologies, to build lots of applications and, and things like this. And people often get scared by the prospect that can you really have thousands and thousands of applications? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, it is the kinds of things we can apply this to uh, is limited by our imagination. The, uh, the AI class at Stanford, CS221, last year, had a, there were, it had about 750 or so students. And um, uh, towards, the last, uh, towards the end of the quarter, the, 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 the instructor professor uh, Percy Lang uh, decided to open it up to students to do their own posters and projects. And uh, there was a poster session from these 700 odd kids. They broke themselves up into 300 teams of two to three people each. It was astonishing the kinds of things they came up with in three weeks. There were 320 or so fantastic applications that all of them came up with. So I think that, um, as Mr. Zhang said, you have to shed the fear of this and uh, understand it and see what it can do for it. I mean, one request I would have for everybody who is here is go to the makerspace that we at Infosys put together with the Carnegie Mellon. Uh, it was a conversation that we had. Uh, actually, Pascal, we were there last year in, in Dubai, and we decided to put that space up here. It was too short a notice to put it in Davos, so we said, okay, we'll put it in, in Dalian. And here it is, and, and go make something. There is a bunch of robots that kids have made up there with the hummingbird kit, and uh, uh, I think this is your point uh, about democratizing this and opening it up. So do something, you know? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I'm not, um, very briefly, if you can, because we've got to take some questions. Well, you know, if, if we look at what we do, there are essentially two <laughs> things. Things that save time, things that kill time. Uh, things that save time, like office, uh, you know, the CRM, ERPs. Uh, or in a software that does machine translation or task of driving. Those are the things to make sure we save more time. There are also things we do to kill time, you know, games, you know, more creative contents, you know, uh, travel or, or entertainment. So I think in the future, uh, the jobs that fall into more kill time uh, will have more opportunity to survive. Um, and actually, we're going to spend more time enjoying life. Okay. That's what it is all, right. all about. Sorry, I'm going to have to take questions on the floor. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, do we have any questions? Um, oh, we've got a couple over here. In fact, we've got quite a few over here. I don't know where the microphone is, though. Back there. There's a gentleman here. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm Rohit. I'm in the insurance sector. Well, one of the things, AI is quite relevant in the insurance sector. Where it's hitting a lot is on the low value manual work, so claims, operations, and so on. But I also think it's creating a host of opportunities on the business process improvement side as well as on the coding, robotics side. But how are you thinking about the reskilling and upskilling part of it? Because we're also going to be creating a whole workforce which probably will not be needed in the near future. But at the same time, we need this whole 
host of new age skill sets which our industry does not have today. So there are lots of jobs in insurance, uh, uh, as you said, maintenance, operations, uh, even some of the actuarial and risk calculations and so forth, which can be better done with AI already. Um, so I think that uh, from the point of view of efficiency, from the point of view of business benefit, and even from the point of view of freeing people from do things that we ought not to be doing, we can already do a lot of these things. Um, so what is the impact of that? What does that mean um, for the workforce? I think uh, in order to build these systems, build these models, build these trainings, maintenance of the AI systems, the robotic process automation systems, and so forth. These are things that require people. Now, we can uh, discuss and model and argue about is the new, uh, the jobs that are being created, is, are the numbers the same, um, uh, is the f financial benefit they provide the same, and so forth. And perhaps that is not the case. But nonetheless, there is clearly an opportunity to, uh, to, to build new kinds of jobs, to create new kinds of opportunities and yet also improve the business and how it has been, while at the same time uh, getting rid of a lot of the things that can already be done better uh, with technology. Okay. Um, do we have any other, do we have any questions on this side of the room? Because I don't want to look like I'm, no, nobody's over there. Okay, then in that case, I'm going to go back over here to this gentleman. Hello there, my name is Stefan. I'm a member of the Global Shapers community, uh, the World Economy Forum. So thank you so much. I especially like the part when you touched about the value system um, so let me ask a question regarding a few years in the future, when the application of AI will be more and more general. By that I mean AI capable of being applied in several domains rather than now. So many people are arguing that as this takes place, as AI becomes more general, um, the kind of, of value system that you have behind will really, really matter. So my question to you is, in this scenario, do you imagine an AI, a general AI, developed, for instance, in China, different for one developed in the US or different for one developed in Europe. Does this make sense? Does this argument make sense for you or not? Pascal? Yeah, I would say that, um, definitely they will be different. Um, AI, a, uh, general AI, any system, they will be different because there are cultural differences between the education systems, the engineers. When we're talking about interdisciplinary education, we might not be able to get that today. But we can get uh, engineers from different cultures work together. So I teach a class where I teach uh, undergraduate students to build interactive systems out of APIs and SDKs that some of us, some of uh, built by us, some by other companies. And this is just amazing because I can teach in few months they can build something they want, uh, a virtual agent and an interactive system in a few months. So that's the democratization part, uh, part of it. And then the second thing what I saw is that you know, I let them imagine what they want to build, all right? And they wanted to build something that would help Alzheimer patients, they want to build something that would de uh, detect abusive language, and so on and so forth. All AI for good. So, whew. <laughs> but um, there was one uh, group that built, uh, wanted to build a vi virtual girlfriend. So that was uh, <laughs> questionable. It's but <laughs> another thing, it, indeed. Um, another thing, though, is that I noticed that among the students from different cultural backgrounds, they have different tendencies. They, they have different inclinations. They might focus on different aspects of building this AI system, which requires many different perspectives. So there are people who are more from education systems where they are more, let's say, mathematically inclined, others who just want to hack. Uh, I don't know how to say this, but build really powerful systems that will beat all the other systems. <laughs> and yet others actually care about human-machine interactions more, right? Uh, you can guess this background from life sciences, for example. And so I thought that this is amazing because if you can get people from different backgrounds to work together, if you get, can get nations to work together, and not just companies in one country working with other companies in that country, but different, country, uh, different companies across different nations to work together on some joint projects of general AI, then I think we will, be, have, we will stand a better chance of building something that will, um, let's say, uh, fulfill the uh, value system that's more universal. Right? There, there are certain things that are universal, others are not. But if we can work together with different people, different companies from different backgrounds, I think that's very essential for the future development of a technology, rather than the, um, you know, the separation and uh, even contention between the different companies. Great. 
Um, do we have any other? Uh, it's one over here. If I don't know where the I microphone is. Add on the one uh, while we're, if, while okay. the microphone's getting over there, if you can briefly, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Oh, come, right. come on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sure, there, there's sure the common value of a human being. I think that should follow. But also, of course, it should adapt to different culture and individuals. And, and also, you know, AI, uh, in, in the past, I would say, you know, for all those years, machine has been learning how people actually think. You know, like you know, CNN is, is developed from uh, uh, the understanding of human uh, visual system. But also, it can help unlock the the mystery of, uh, of brains. Mm -hmm. I see Professor Tom Mitchell is a pioneer of yeah. AI from CMU. Brief, and he actually has done a lot of work in, in that area. Uh, so there, there's the interaction between the human intelligence and the digital intelligence, and they're actually mutually enforcing. Very quickly, please. I'm a journalist from Dalian Broadcasting Company. I have a question for Mr. Zhang, I have to speak in uh, Chinese. I'm very interested in the artificial brain produced by Baidu, so I have several questions for you. First of all, a lot of people believe that AI is at a very preliminary stage. How do you interpret that? What's your opinion? Has Baidu prepared well for AI? How do uh, technology companies to better research on uh, AI? <laughs> Thank you for, for the question. Uh, you know, we are still at the very early stage of uh, you know, AI. You know, it's uh, you know, been used in lots of uh, our products, uh, but I would say we are at a very, very early stage. You know, it's actually in our search. You, know, you can do voice and a picture and a face, a search. Uh, and and uh, the constant driving, the L3 and L4, are using a lot of uh, the AI technologies in our uh, financial system, in the Baidu cloud. So it's already there. In the next few years, you know, we are going to invest everything in AI, better company AI. So we are developing a uh, operating system for AI, just like Windows for PC, Android, uh, iOS for mobile. We're developing a operating system for, for AI. We develop key scenarios you know, for home, for cars, and for Baidu Cloud, which you reach to business. Uh, but you know, we are working with all the companies to create the ecosystem, uh, not only in China, but also around the world. And again, it's about openness. So we open our OS, open systems. Mm -hmm. We open our deep learning platform called the Pedal Pedal. We open our autonomous uh, driving platform uh, that is uh, we call it Apollo. Uh, I know, you know it's time's limited, but uh, you know, I, I think we are very excited about all the things that uh, uh, for AI. OK, um, so I'm afraid that's all we're going to be able to do with questions. Perhaps you can ask some of the speakers afterwards if you have specific things. Um, I'd just like to go around quickly, um, go around this way, please, um, with the one thing that, um, that you're going to take away from this discussion as food for thought. Um, and we'll have to be brief, I'm afraid. Uh, sure. Um, one thing that we didn't quite address with the idea of what countries are ready to adopt this and move forward, I think that there, when, I, when I heard earlier the Minister for Sweden in the digital economy session talk about the Nordic countries and how they've created a, a social safety net, they've created certain uh, things that will allow for a transition uh, for their communities into these new technologies. And I think it just struck me how critical it is to establish a sense of trust within a community, within a society, within a nation, in order to get the buy-in from the community for us to optimize uh, you know, the applications of these new technologies. Um, so I think trust, trust is a critical aspect of how can we create policies to enact uh, a sense of trust within our societies. Great. Thank you. Wendell. It hasn't fully been in this conversation, but the thing that concerns me the most is that AI is going to exacerbate inequalities. And it's not that we can't find ways optimistically of creating jobs or re-educating or you know, relieving people from drudgery and so forth. It's just that it's not going to just happen. And it's not just implicit in the technology that it's going to happen. So if we're going to keep with the themes of this conference of inclusiveness, I think we really have to recognize that's going to take real work, not just from the AI companies, from us as a society, to make sure that we don't exacerbate inequalities and we include everybody in this development. OK, thank you. So my takeaway is um, a little bit um, 
kind of variation of what you just said. I do see there is an emerging AI divide, you know, compared to digital divide. There's an AI divide between consumers and developers. We don't seem to, we don't have the same fear, we don't have the same concerns. There's an AI divide between countries that have, uh, you know, uh, more research labs and those who don't. Um, there's an AI divide between also the genders. All right, who, who, who gets to participate in this AI, the industrial revolution? Who gets to benefit from it? Uh, even though most of the world's consumers are actually female, and most of the developers are male. So there is a divide uh, in every aspect of, uh, of the society in terms of AI. And our job, and a very difficult job that we have to do, is to bridge this kind, all these divides. And also the divide between human <laughs> values and machine uh, seemingly lack of value. Right. So I think that's what we have to do. Okay. Yachin. Well, you know, AI is the cornerstone of the fourth industry revolution. Uh, and the scale and the impact will be uh, more profound than electricity or steam engine. Um, and on the other hand, we need to be uh, conscious of all the consequences, you know, whether it's uh, uh, jobs, or a divide, digital divide, or AI divide. Uh, so we need all uh, parts of uh, the business, uh, government, NGOs, academics, uh, to work together. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm uh, very encouraged by the conversation and uh, um, with the depth of thought, and uh, it, it comforts you that you know these very powerful and potentially dangerous <laughs> technologies are in good hands if thoughts like this are in the minds of the leaders. The uh, takeaways are, um, are by and large still the same as I have always had. We have had breathtaking applications of AI developed in the last few years, which there is no doubt are going to have a profound impact on a huge part of our society. Uh, and that impact is going to be irrevocable, it is going to be serious, and we need to take very, very, as, as Wendell said, do much hard work to uh, address that. Uh, at the same time, the second point is that uh, we are still very early in the development of AI. Uh, there is a lot more work to be done in building much more complex cognitive capabilities, which all of us as humans have, and we are decades out on those. Uh, the inevitable march, and these technologies are exponential in nature, so we are going to get there at some point, perhaps not in our lifetimes, perhaps in our children's lifetimes, but, but we will. And uh, that point will come. And, and the, the third point, therefore, is that the only answer to this situation is a much more pervasive role of education. The, as Pascal said, the gap between the ones who build and the ones who consume, it has to be narrowed. The, the, we have to make it a societal responsibility uh, to develop a culture of, of learning, a culture of tinkering, a culture of making. Um, assuming we get to the point where an artificially intelligent system is able to do anything that can be mechanically described, that can be precisely articulated. What is the human frontier at that point? Mm -hmm. My sense is that at that point, the human frontier is creativity. It is, it is our ability to look at the world around us and see what is not there, uh, and to be able to build that, to do problem finding, if you will, mm -hmm. if problem solving is going to be completely automated. So I think that uh, just as with any incredibly powerful technology that we have built. Um, there is a lot of uh, impact that is inevitable that is coming our way. Uh, and yet, uh, there is the potential of that is even higher. And I think that is what we should take away from all this. OK. All right. Um, so it leads, it, uh, it's for me to uh, make some concluding remarks, which I'm going to do very briefly. Um, I'm going to do them in three words, in fact. So, so I think what we've concluded, or what the panel has concluded, and um, what I hope some of you in the room will also have concluded, is we do want AI to be unleashed. We do want the power of um, the power that it can bring to us, the power it can bring us to reshape and improve our societies. Um, we do want the power of innovation. Um, but we also want to understand. Um, and we don't just want to understand the machines, where there is some work to do. We also understand, want to understand other people and human beings and how we interact and how we fit together. And that might, in some ways, be more important from the point of view of the societies that we want to live in in the future. And my third word is include, which has come up over and over again. Um, we need to include more people um, in, in AI. And that means both in terms of building and in using, in terms of um, across nationalities, across genders, across whatever kinds of um, classification system you could use to, to venture. So unleash, 
Um, understand, include, and I think that's basically what we're saying about AI. Uh, please join me in thanking our panel once again. Thank you.